to Juice Podcast. I'm Emily Harmon. I'm Gwen Douglas. And today we are doing sherry, but specifically dry sherry. Cool. I feel like uh, cool. here, here, here I am. You guys can join my private sherry masterclass because <laughs> I know little. <laughs> so I love sherry. So when we're talking about sherry, we're not talking about cherries, just to make that really clear. Sh- 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 sherry. Sherry. Yeah. So sherry coming from um, Andalusia in the in the south of Spain, very close to the uh, Portuguese border, actually. Um, and it's an area, there are sort of three main sherry towns, um, San Luca de Barrameda, which is the man, where the Manzanilla is coming from, Cadiz and Jerez, and the vineyards are found all around there. Um, I guess the region itself is really known for this Alboritza soil, which is a type of chalk, okay. uh, which brings lovely freshness to the wines, it's a very hot area. Um, and there are some hills, but they're kind of more, kind of like vast slopes rather than rolling yeah. yeah. hills. Okay. Gotcha. And uh, the main grape variety here is Palomino. Mm-hmm. And I always remember this. The way that I always remember the grape variety of Sherry is because San Luca de Barrameda is very famous for horse riding, horse oh, riding on the beach. Horses. And then I think of Palomino horses. And oh, yeah. that was a way, that was my own little tip that I always give people learning about wine if that helps them remember the grape variety. But Probably not. If you don't know Palomino is a horse. And <laughs> Are they, are they good looking horses? Yeah, they are. They're like, they're like a, a bra- light brown color, color with the blonde hair. Almost like somebody from Saint Tropez. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, so Palomino is the main grape variety. And sherry, sherry wine is a fortified wine. And not all of it's made under floor, but the dry wines that we're trying today is made under dry floor. Wine. So we'll get into what floor is as we go. Uh, but the sort of driest, lightest styles of sherry, uh, the two that we have in our glasses here. So we've got Manzanilla. So not your grandma's sherry, basically. Yes, no Harvey's Bristol Cream here today, guys. Not what you so find in the cupboard. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but actually, you know, there's a place for it. Yeah, absolutely, there's a and place and a time for everything. Yeah, and sherry, in some ways, is very much like champagne for a number of reasons. One, um, it's a product that is often non-vintage. Right. It's a product that's also, a, uh, so because it's non-vintage, it's a blend of all Yes, yeah. exactly. And then um, it's, a, it's, a, it's also a wine that is really known for its blending. Mm-hmm. And then... Celebration. The other commonality I find between sherry and champagne is the diversity in styles, which oh, makes it amazing for food. So you could actually drink sherry throughout an entire bit. Right. Like you could start with dry sherry and have like oysters, for example, yeah. and then you could go through to some of the sweeter ones and have like pork chop, for example, yeah. like things like yeah, that. Nice. Even yeah. dry oloroso, for example, and then go through to like a chocolate dessert with Pedro Jimenez. Yeah. So yes. there's so much. And cocktails, so you can do anything with it. Yeah. Exactly. Love it. My favorite little twist on martini is with a, a dash of manzanilla or a dash of fino. And today, while I was googling some sherry stuff, I saw something I'm going to try called the East Indian Negroni rum and cream sherry, but I'm, I'm down to try this amazing. into a cocktail day, yeah. another day. So we'll start with, so we've got two, basically we'll start with these two sherries. So we've got Manzanilla and Fino, which are essentially the same okay. in terms of how they're made. They're exactly the same. The difference is, is where they're made. Uh-huh. So Manzanilla always comes from the town of San Luca de Barrameda, which is very close to the sea. So That's it has a slightly... Like Palomino horses running on the beach. Exactly. And then we have a, a slightly different climatic condition here to the okay. other sherry towns and where the other vineyards are here. So because of the proximity to the sea, mm-hmm. we have a more moderate climate, right. which means less fluctuation throughout the year and also through okay. day and night. So I guess the, yeah, because the sea just keeps it. Yes, and also the, a little bit more the saltiness area, from right. the sea yeah. too. Um, more humidity, obviously, mm-hmm. as well. And then as you go inland to Cadiz and Jerez, right. you have more extremes between day and night temperatures and more extremes through the seasons as well. So okay. what you find is this layer of floor, which we'll get to what that is, it fluctuates differently. So oh, for instance, in, in San Luca, it's more constant, but like kind of, let's say, medium. And then in Cadiz, you have times in the, uh, in the year, you have times where it's like very, very thin, almost gone and then other times it's very very so I guess that changes how much oxidization it gets if it's really thin it gets yeah and I think also like the flavor of the wine is slightly different also the grape varieties because of that those hot sunny days like fino tends to be a little bit richer sometimes than manzanilla too manzanilla tends to be a little bit more fresh but they're both made with palomino palomino the same way so what happens is grapes are picked wine comes into the cellar the cellar master goes around checks all the wines decides 
Oh yeah, they get is, graded, right? Uh, exactly. Is this going to be? Is this the profile in the wine that's suitable for Fino gotcha. or Manzanilla, the dry styles, or is it more suitable for the sweeter styles? Okay. If it's decided that it's for a drier style, it's fortified to a certain percentage. Right. So most of the dry sherries, I think it's like fourteen and a half to fifteen and a half for Manzanilla and Fino, mm -hmm. and then for the sweet ones, it gets fortified at a higher rate. To right. The floor, which we'll get to, dies, dies and yeah. cannot exist. So the sweet cherries like Oloroso never, gotcha. never have any floor because okay, they're yeah. fortified so the floor can never grow. Never grows. Gotcha. And then here, we so what we've got here, Cellar Master's decided this is going to be dry sherry, Fino right. Antonia, fortified to a certain percent. Floor grows on the wine, which is a layer of yeast, a little bit like when we talked about in the Jura episode. Yeah, like a veil the veil, but it's yeah, it's known as floor, and then that layer of yeast grows over the wine. And that protects the wine from oxidizing, which is why this looks like a standard white wine, because if that layer of yeast was not on the darker. wine, yeah, it would yeah. go brown, it would take on more nuttiness. But what it does, I always think of it a little bit like, imagine cutting open an apple and okay, covering the apple with yeah. cling film to stop it from yes. spoiling from the air. And that layer of yeast right. being a little bit like the clean film, it's not going to protect it from ever from changing right. colour, but it's going to slow down that process. That's, that's a great actually yeah. way to put it. And also flavour it. So the yeast yeah, also totally. gives this this slight nuttiness and this little mm -hmm. yeastiness to the to the wine as well. Um, but yeah, so that that's the diff That is literally how Fino and Manzanilla okay. is made. And that floor can live depending on barrel to barrel, up to I think the oldest wine I know. I think it could. Five to seven years would be as late as it can get, wow. but most of it's a couple of years. Couple of years. Okay. Yeah. And then it's like eating whatever it wants to eat. And exactly. Dies away. Exactly, because yeah. there's nothing for it to sustain no itself yeah. on anymore. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. And that floor character also gives even more of an impression of freshness in the wines. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I think it's to do with the production of acid aldehydes in the in the wine that does that. But very cool. Um, I mean, already yeah. the smell is intoxicating of just. Sitting here, yeah, it and to smells really nice. Yes. Yeah. And then it reminds me of just eating food every time I smell sherry. But I actually just make me hungry. There's a savouriness about the smell that's like, it's like you want to like, yeah, yeah, get in there. And I think one thing just to touch on as well, because you mentioned the Solera system, because I think it's important that yes. people know Solera system and they know what that means in the blending yes. is that there's something that happens with, in sherry bodegas, which are which is called fractional blending. So if you imagine every year you fill a barrel, obviously not the whole way, and then there's another row of barrels from the year before that was not filled properly. Uh, and a the part, pyramids yeah, pyramids. exactly. So little part pieces of the new wine goes into this master blend, and the reason for this is just to create that brown and that and consistency. consistency. It's the same champagne, exactly. The non vintage yeah. thing. Yeah. So like, it's cool when you see a bottle that's like hundred years or more on the bottle. I mean, there's going to be fractional amounts of yes. what was there, but it's still there. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, this first one. So Honestly, the first one for everybody listening on podcast is the non-vintage mm. Guterres uh, Colossia um, Manzanilla. I just want to check. It's not a Cuvée name. No, it just says Manzanilla Seco. I mean, this already smells like some kind of, some wine. Just, yes. Just, I mean, I've definitely had some wines that already smell similar. Yeah, it's got this nuttiness, like almost like almond pith. Like but then, in the Jura right now. Yes. But like for me, quite a lot of apple, mm. apple yes. fruit. You smell the apple already when you're just sitting over here. Yeah. Just the smell is that cut apple smell. Mum, mm. <sighs> So delicious. So yeah, it's got this lovely saltiness. Oh yeah. That's a light, refreshing, yeah. salty, dry, thirst quenching mm. goodness. Yum. Goodness. Yeah, it's really good. good. Yeah, because there's so much of it tastes like a wine, and then there's just that little like bomb of salty. Yes, it gets you in the middle. There's this little um, like bar snack that you see in Spain called a gilda, which is usually a toothpick which has a pickled onion, an olive, sometimes an anchovy on there as well, and then like these pickled chilies, and you just eat it in one go. So it's just like this on the side. So yeah, this, on the, this on the side, and it's just yeah. like when you have that and this, you're just like, oh my god! I, mean, I could just live like yeah. this forever. Ah, yum! I mean, yeah. I totally want to eat that right now. <laughs> yes, I'm quite hungry. <laughs> so. And yeah. how do you find it? I mean, did you taste the fino as well? I'd be interested to no, see I what you think is the difference yet. between the two. I mean, the smell-wise, already this is taking me away from 
wine into something, into its new incarnation? Because this still smells like wine to me. Yeah, I mean, this is definitely a bit fruitier and it's a bit lighter, whereas when I smell the pheno, I get like almost some waxy notes as well. I can see that. Like a wax apple. And, and almost like a kind of different type, like a golden delicious apple rather than a Granny Smith green apple like yes. you see in the Manzanilla. I think like both of them have that, when you said apple smell, it is like the smell of an oxidized apple. Particularly this one. This one, yeah. yeah. Like so really the ones that you've cut up, they've been left in a bowl, if you've covered them you take it off, that's the smell you yes. get this like... For me it's like yellow apple. apple skin. It's funny because like also pineapple does the smell also where it gets that bruised apple smell. Yes, yeah. What were we And then I bought some like cheap pineapple juice recently and it's like driving me, I can't drink it because all I can think of is bruised pineapples when I'm drinking it. It upsets well, me. Well that's because you're a pineapple snob because there's nobody else I know that has the pineapple in their house who's <laughs> yeah. 165 yeah. days of the year. I know. <laughs> but yeah, this is really... Also, I really like how, like... They're crazy different, how, but similar at yeah, the same time. But how they also skirt the line between savoury and sweetness. This, like, what I, I mean, for anybody who appreciates umami, <laughs> I mean, th this is, especially like, this number one. Especially this one, is yeah. like, I mean, we're gonna get more umami as well. So the, so the fino that we're drinking for everybody... This is, like, also <laughs> sauce. For everybody is the Cesar Florido fino. And I really like this producer, and actually, they're a little bit different actually to other finos because they are in Chipiona, which is actually not that far um, from the coast. So they are a saltier, like it's more similar to a Manzanilla than other finos. Usually, there'd be a little bit more of a marked difference between the two. And I'm sure as well, what we're seeing, I'd have to check the backs of the bottles to see if there are bottling dates, because not everybody does it. It could be that they were bottled at different times as well. You know what I want to eat with this? Fried rice. Fried rice. Yeah, switch it. <laughs> I want to eat some fried rice, like mm. pork fried rice, mushroom fried rice. Mm, that would be fucking delicious. It would. Actually, it would. I've never thought about that. Like, just the... With the little shrimps in. Yeah, even with the shrimps in. I mean, mm. I'm like, ah, ah, Lucas went through a phase of making a lot of tiny dried shrimp stuff, and I'd be like, is there a tiny shrimp in here? But I cut it really small. <laughs> I mean, so it doesn't exist. I mean, it tastes pretty fucking If you strong, can't but... see it, it doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, like, okay. It's like when a kid goes, you can't see me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but this would be actually phenomenal mm. with some Chinese food. Yeah. And I mean, mm. look, really simple pairing. Like a plate of ham on. Yeah, yum. Ham on. Ham on. Come on, ham on. <laughs> Come on, ham on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yum. Hmm. Even like, I mean, it's just, because of the umami ness, I think it's like a really interesting thing for pairing like all those other odd um umami things. Yes. Like eggs. Miso. Yeah, miso. Eggy dishes. This mm. would be great also with like an omelette. Mm. Even like a pork broth. Ramen. Oh, yeah. Ramen. Ramen. <laughs> Yum. Yeah. It's interesting Amazing. with this fino, it's just got this touch of oiliness to it as well, which gives it even more of this umaminess than the manzanilla. Yeah, maybe because it, the way it coats it's your just, mouth, yeah, this yeah, really yeah. like gets into every cranny. Where this is like... Yeah, like drinking the water of the ocean. Yeah. Wow, really... Mm. And I still stand by this statement, I've said it for a long time. The wines from Sherry are the best value wines in the world. <laughs> Because you don't pay much for the bottles, even right. the top ones, like even the like single barrel when that wine's been really? sitting there for like, I mean I've had wines, there's a wine that I love which I couldn't get hold of for the podcast which is called um, Tresillo from uh, Emilio Hidalgo and it's, and so it's Tresillo 1874 and it's a Solera that was started then. And you try, you try this wine, and you're just like, oh my god! I mean, the trade price in the UK, I think, is like for is over forty. So it's like a two. It's almost like a two hundred pound cherry, like wow. one hundred and eighty or something. If you put it on a full margin, and you're trying, like the average age of that wine is like something like forty five years, Crazy. like through the blending, yeah. and it's just like it's so detailed and complex every time you go back for it, and you're just like you just don't get this level of quality, right. and this. This also this level of like craftsmanship actually. I mean, this um, is a and, lot. And the story and history and all of that sort of stuff. I guess it's like such a different creative process to making something like this because you always have to take into consideration what came before you. There's no way to break free 
quickly. Like if you get hired, you you are actually sort of yeah, but stu- it's stewardship in many totally, ways. Yes, exactly. I think it's just a really interesting and different creative process for someone making these kind of wines because a bit like Barolo, actually. Yeah. You can't just go off on your own direction. You have to. You are chained somehow to what happened before. It becomes your launching pad for what you do. You can, yes, because you can also with some of these wines, you're never going to see the results of it. Lots of no, exactly. So I think it's what really fascinating in terms of like the people making it and how they. Mm-hmm. approach what they make because it's actually a very uh, less ego driven than wine for whoever's making it because you're part of a community of people in time before you and after you that you're just part of the puzzle I mean it's interesting the other thing that's also interesting about this area is there are like Spaniards that are doing this but there's also obviously as well there's like a huge influence oh, from, okay. from UK colonialism yes because I, I wanted to ask about this because I know that there's some type but sherry is one there of them ba- yeah it's the same also like with port for example right. like you have a lot of influence as well from different families right. and wealthy families in these areas but also how it travelled right that yeah. a lot of these fortified mines were kind of the only thing that would make it to England yeah I mean that's also why like, there are why many fortified, theories yeah. around why that they even yes. fortified and one of it was one of the theories that you see with a lot of these regions was longevity yeah. and travelability and yeah getting into boats really cool yeah both yeah. delicious you know I don't think I've had a sherry in a really long time like a really long time and I like port I love a good port and tonic with lemon in the summertime white port yeah white port mm-hmm. and tonic delicious do you think are these also cocktailable? Yeah, I mean, so here at Aura, where we are, which is my restaurant for anybody that's on audio uh, that, that Gwen and I are sitting in at the moment, we serve Fino with tonic water. Yeah, lovely. I mean, I would it's amazing. It's so refreshing and delicious. Light, and it's also lighter than a gin and tonic. Right. But really good. And we, we always have at least two sherries by the glass here, too. But nice. A Fino, usually a, like a Fino and a Montiello dry sherries, because I think. You know, actually, there's almost no sherry culture here so in Germany. I actually would say, like, so the last time I had a, well, one of the times I had a port and tonic and white port and tonic and recommended to Luki and uh, Lucas Moratz when we were out at this Thai place, I actually think this would be also a great, when we just talked about, like, the other one being great with fried rice or something, I think a cocktail version with tonic and whatever would be great mm. for Asian food also. Yes. I mean, Asian food, like particularly Japanese food, yeah. I, I think sherry is amazing for. I remember Even being Thai on Thai food to go yes. up against fish sauce and all that kind yes. of stuff. And, yeah. and, like, and also, like, a lot of lime, garlic, yes. you know, like you need stuff that has a, enough personality. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I think Thai is a good call. I was, I actually, the, my first trip to Hereth was maybe, I mean, it was, yeah, it was before I moved to Berlin. So I think, I think it was in like 2014. I think, and I remember going, and I was with uh, a friend of mine, Ben, who had he'd been buying for uh, a restaurant called Rocker in mm-hmm. London, which is like an incredible Japanese restaurant, very okay. high quality. Um, and and he was buying like he was buying a lot of sherry, and I said, oh, how do you find it work? And they, they he actually said like sherry is amazing with a lot of the things because also when you look at foods like sushi, for example, even. Like if you speak to, even though typically everyone thinks you drink sake with it, actually if you go to a lot of sushi yeah, bars right. in, in Tokyo, pe- Japanese people are drinking beer yeah, or, okay. or something else because su- like sake and sushi is, is something that's both, uh, or sashimi even, it's textural but actually doesn't have that much flavour in many cases. Mm-hmm. So to actually have something with a bit more flavour, like wine, it's like... Yes. Transform sushi and sashimi. I mean, I feel like the next time we go to 893 here, I want to order a bottle of sherry. Yes, like, be delicious. Also, even yeah. just even just with like soba noodles with the soup that you get with that yeah. would be nice. I mean, looking at I mean, he because he worked in like Japanese restaurants for a long time. We eat a lot of that kind of stuff at home, and hmm, giving me pause for thought for buying stuff at home. It's interesting, isn't it? Soup also, because looking at also, it won't be long until you're drinking. Oh no! Also, I know. <laughs> also, because looking, I mean, I always think about my partner. Obviously, when we're thinking about like buying stuff. Together, but I think Lucas would also love this because he loves so much the Jura. And Oscar, yeah, and he's so like really, and also he cooks a lot of umami food as yes, well. Yes, I think this is sort of something he hasn't thought of. I'm just for those of you on audio. I'm just presenting the next. I know this one because she's double parked. Oh yeah, okay, yes. double parked. So the next one oh, that we. <laughs> so the next one that we're moving on to is Val Vespino Teodego Amontillado. So it's a single vineyard. 
uh, wine, it's it's dry, like cherry. Topaz. Yes. I, I actually do, it's funny because Valdespino, they are one of the larger, larger producers, not one of the biggest though, but they are a large, okay. large producer. And I think sometimes the wines get overlooked by the wine trade because of the name. Yeah, okay. But the quality is really good. Like, I mean, I love this Amontillado and I love their Palo Cortado as well. Um, but I, for the context of today, it only made sense to sort of focus in on dry sherries. Yeah, it's just like such a massive world anyway and yeah. I think everyone would get confused, including myself. Totally. So Amontillado, for people that don't know what Amontillado is, Amontillado is a mature or aged Fino slash Manzanilla. So basically what... <laughs> the family tree! Yeah. <laughs> the whole like telenovela about exactly. the sherry exactly. family. So think about... <laughs> exactly. Who's not making crochet? Yes. So like imagine like the Fino and the Manzanilla like adolescents and then this is the... The, the fully grown, the matriarch, fully the fledged, matriarch exactly, the fully fledged adult. So what happens is the floor dies naturally because right. it can't sustain itself anymore because there's nothing to feed it's itself. Not food. Exactly. Um, so what happens then is you have a barrel with beautiful floor aged sherry in that's obviously not full with no covering. So then it starts to go into an oxidative process where there is more exposure to oxygen, which gives it this color, and it starts to take more flavor from the oxidative right. processes, but also the longer this wine is in barrel, because they are only using barrel in, in cherry, or the sherry areas. Julian, all that flavor It also, also starts that. to take more. So when you try like a really old Amontillado that's been in barrel for decades, like it, it's almost like licking a piece of wood. Like wow. it's so dry from wow. all of these woody flavors. So you get more and more of that in this process. So yes. Amontillado generally could be anywhere between, on average, seven to 12 years, but like way older depending on the producer as well. The and smell you can see, amazing. just one thing to point out, it's 18% alcohol. So oh, no, no. the reason for that also is, is that like obviously, the longer the wine is in barrel, the, the more, more concentrated, it produces, yeah, the more concentrated yeah. it is, the higher okay. the alcohol goes as well. It smells amazing, and I would wear this like a perfume because it is like exactly what I look for in a perfume, which is like skirting the nutty, woody. Yeah, but sort of like also skirting the the line between masculine and feminine. If we're yeah. going to use this, and you know what, this always reminds me of a little bit like so you get this like butterscotch tart. Yeah, I mean, you know? it's like totally like caramel, oh, yeah, salted butter, caramel, exactly, butter salted butter caramel, butterscotch. butterscotch. And then there's almost like this kind of slightly little bit of like prune character there yeah, as totally. well. And then the nuttiness too. Yeah, the prune thing is... And it goes more into this like too. baked or roasted almond mm -hmm. kind of note. The smell is really amazing. Mm. I'd be curious to see if someone makes a sherry perfume. Mm. And when you try it, more glycerol. So there's more texture, there's more, more of this kind of silkiness on the palate. Mm. But then more of the nuttiness on the finish where you've got this really dry finish. For me, this is like... And there's that umami finish at the end. Big time. Mm. Like it literally tastes like um, like the pith of nuts, like walnut, almond. I mean, it's um, actually something that I really like about anything that's oxidative style because walnut is my favorite nut of all time. Yeah. So anything that has that like bitter, sweet, mm. nutty... This is really delicious. It's funny where it's like, it takes you somewhere and you're like, it's like trying to catch the end of a... Because it's reminding me of lots of things and I can't quite put my finger on it. Mm. Yeah, I'm a big fan of this. Also, I think this as well is just, I mean, it's so gastronomic. This is also something for me, so I love a, like a Montiardo, uh, also with like some like particular cheeses. Like usually mm -hmm. like an aged cow's milk cheese. This could be interesting with as a pairing. I don't, I stay away from blue cheese with this. I would have more like a, some of the sweeter styles like Oloroso, uh, Dolce, the sweeter styles of Oloroso blue. Like, what was that truffle cheese that we had at my place? That'd be good because that was quite salty yeah, as well. Yeah, pecorino, yeah. it was like a truffle pecorino. Yeah. I think this would be nice with this. I agree. It'd be epic. Mm. Mm. Actually, there's like, also again makes me think of lots of like odd food pairings, I think. I have. I, I think, think I have the ultimate food thinking, here. I don't know why I think fish, but I don't know what kind of fish you would serve with it. Like but like, weird I mean, like, for example, with the Fino and Manzanilla, when you're in Jerez, like when I was yeah. there, we went to bars where you had like a lot of, almost like tempura, where you had a lot of fried fish, yeah. fried anchovies, and you were having this, yeah. and it was just amazing. But I, I understand, I think even with this, like you'd have like pork katsu, for example. Yeah, I don't know, there's just like 
fishy, yeah, like a f- ramen oh, pork katsu. Pork katsu mm. would be epic with this. Yes. Also, like I remember one dish I had with ramen from Montiardo sure. that I love, which was like a, an autumnal pork dish. So it was like pork loin, and it had lots of like yeah. mushrooms, oh, yeah. mushrooms and nuts, like almonds. Yeah. So it was great. And the other thing, which I think is like hands down one of the best pairings I've ever had with the Montiardo, was this. Tatia cheese, which is like it's called tatia because it's like a teat like shape, like a titty, like a titty. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and it's and I love the names of cheeses. It's a little bit like an unsmoked scamozza for anybody oh, that's okay, had that. So that kind of texture, where it's a bit rubbery, yeah, but it's not like halloumi. It's like kind yeah, of right. a bit more stretched to it. So having that grilled, mm-hmm. so it's like fully melted with quince jam and then like broken walnuts I mean, over the top. And I used you to fantasize like 100% of this. I, I used to fantasize about this. I mean, I honestly do think there's nothing better, better in the world. But the only thing better than cheese is, is melted cheese. <laughs> Put that on a shirt. <laughs> you know what's better than cheese? Melted cheese. If you're like doing toasted cheese sandwiches anyway, everyone's gonna buy one. Cause as soon as they smell like melted cheese, they're just like, it's like donuts. You can't escape the smell of melted <laughs> no, cheese. Know. I used to work with a guy who, I mean, I'm going to say the smell of molten cheese in a tattoo shop is not what you expect. But he was really into making tosties. Like, tosty king. Maybe I even talked about it. It's a tosty. To- like a grilled cheese, basically. Like a toasty. But in the Netherlands, they call them tosties. Okay. And he would always do like that bread. That's a different connotation to me. Bread, cheese, bread, cheese, toast maker. So then you end up with melted cheese and crunchy cheese in the same thing. But then like the whole shop would smell like cheese. You can't escape the smell of cheese. Also, if you're gonna fill a space with the smell of melted cheese, you better make sure there's <laughs> enough for <laughs> everybody. <laughs> yeah. Nobody no. wants that. That's like literally torture. Like if I had if I smelt melted cheese all day, I'd be like, <gasps> oh, I'm I'll tell you what torture is, is the other tosty he told me about when they were kids because apparently his mother was not a fantastic cook. So him and his brother would like race home from school and make what they called a tosty bowl. <laughs> I still one day when I make him Him and his mother? No, him and his brother. Okay, so, so okay. His poor mum, like they would do this basically to like race, race home, make this thing so that mum didn't have to cook. So they would do bread, cheese, bread, cheese. They just do like a stack. Bread and Dutch cheese, you know, it doesn't melt very well. It's awkward. Bread, cheese, bread, cheese, bread, cheese. And then they would fucking microwave it. <laughs> and then when it came out, all cheese here, everywhere. they would make it <laughs> into a ball. And then How could they it. manage that? Would it not be like really I mean, hot? Little boys will do. <laughs> I was about to say boys will be boys, but that's, that that's phrase not cool. is not allowed no. on our podcast. No, little boy. I mean, little boys. children will do whatever they do, and <laughs> these kids decided that it was great fun. I mean, it does have that weird microwave bread does have a strange texture. Well, it's sweaty as hell, isn't it? <laughs> Pack it into an apple shape, and then eat it like an apple. <laughs> Tosty ball. I don't know how I ended up there. <laughs> we went from gastronomic on Montiardo to Tosti Rolls. To the worst. In minutes. I mean, sometimes, sometimes you need contrast to understand it's true. It's how true. nice these are. Yeah, this is delicious. Actually, so like, we can all be happy that we don't have to eat a Tosti Roll today. Yeah. I mean, well, actually, I'm really happy that you chose to focus just on dry. Because today when I was like, doing my prep work watching some videos, I definitely was like overwhelmed with actually how much choice there is within the umbrella of what sherry is. Yeah. I mean, I think at a later date we'll visit sweet sherries, and I think also it's worth visiting just Paolo Cortado on its own to talk about that because it's quite an interesting interesting topic because it's so vague and misunderstood. But But I think, like, for people, I mean, we've we've talked about it a lot in other episodes, this sort of like looking for new things. And maybe sometimes it's not about looking for new locations of things, it's about revisiting new things that don't exist in our timeline. Mm. So like Sherry has a little bit of a like misconception about being like for your grandma, for like an older generation. And I think our palates have developed enough. I mean, you speak to any, like, I mean, Brits, any cement, like in yeah. England as well. Yeah, it's Psalms right. for sure, love it. It's an industry darling. If I go to a corner shop in England, right, the best thing I'm going to buy, and it's not because it's a bad thing, is probably a bottle of Tio Pepe Fino right. 
from Gonzalez BS. And I love that producer. They're huge. They're the biggest producer there by a country mile. But it's also great to see that big producers make good products. Yeah, they do. And they, I mean, their sherry, they're bottling it regularly and they sell it. Yes. So it's, they really like to bottle fresh styles of sherry. Mm, yeah. But like, and just, I think that's one topic just for any of our listeners that don't know how to keep sherry. So you're always yeah. told, <laughs> drink sherry, like as soon as you've got it, the fresher, the better, da 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 da. And I think most people experience the sherry that they've drank that's been in the cupboard like the yeah. whole year that grandma pulls out at Christmas. Yeah, of course. So what I would say is with these styles of sherry, Fino, Manzanilla, Amontillado, for storing them, the best thing you could do would be to keep them in the fridge, 100%. I mean, yeah. It's not the end of the world if you don't, like, but it's better. When in doubt, it's a wine. when in doubt, just put everything just put in, in the fridge. fridge. <laughs> yeah. Like, so keep it in the fridge. That's an adult rule. And if it's unopened, it doesn't need to be kept in the fridge. And I am somebody who actually believes the opposite of what everybody tells you when it comes to drinking sherry as young as possible. So when they say drink nice. it as fresh as possible. So for me, like for example, there's a style, I couldn't get one for today for the podcast, which I'm annoyed about, is a, uh, a style of sherry called Enrama, okay. which literally means this. raw. Uh, and it's a style of sherry where it doesn't have the same filtration processes. Oh, so the whole idea is that when you're drinking this fino or manzanilla, it's almost like you've had it directly from the cask. So it's like even like more you just intense. Have your mouth on yeah, I mean mouth. it's like the equivalent of like the difference of an unfiltered chardonnay to a filtered chardonnay. So there's like even more sherry. Yeah, wow. Yeah. And everybody says in Rama you should consume within six to twelve months. I disagree with in Rama and and anything okay. for these because actually like it's a different style of wine, but it evolved evolve beautifully. Like yeah. beautifully, nobody ages, and I think this could be something that could happen in the future of people aging bottled sherries rather than yeah. the aging being in the barrel yeah, man, and then seeing how that changes. I mean, I'm down. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. We'll start. Let's just fucking do it. We're going to start a sherry bar. <laughs> we'll start a sherry bar. Start, start the sherry bar. Yeah. Sherry yeah. Dish. I mean, I think like, I would say, sherry like, dish. this is a great, like, uh, I mean, for a lot of people that are, especially if you're into Jura wines or you're into oxidative styles of natty wines, fuck, try them because I think like, you, you might be surprised. I think I am surprised because when I think I'm about surprised sherry, that you like it as well because it really went, well. Just I also like sherry wines, wine, but I no. You know, but the Vangelone, you were a little bit like Mah. yeah, because I think Vangelone often has an astringency that is much higher than these. These okay. feel like f- fresh and there's enough acidity, but they don't feel like they're killing me. Okay, like the, when I'm left in my mouth, you know, it's like there's a nice flavor. Sometimes the Vangelone is like. Too much, but I also don't know if I would drink a whole bottle for one meal. You know, I might try different glasses over a meal, or buy something for one dish, and or have it after dinner, have a bit before, have a bit after. I don't know. Mm. I think, yeah, I don't know. It doesn't taste like Maison. <laughs> Good. Yeah. I know. I'm just happy you enjoyed it. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> cool. So I'm excited for the next sherry. Could be a. <laughs> Could be a, a small snippet yearly <laughs> of sherry <laughs> info because yes. I think there is so much to there is absorb. So yeah, this is sh- a, a, a brief introduction into dry sherry. If anyone has any questions um, or wants any tips on which producers to look out for, uh, for those of you, especially in the UK, because it's not so commonplace here in Germany to find sherry in the corner shop but I <laughs> implore you when you're desperate late night like a bottle of tea of Pepe will be delicious yeah if you like sherry obviously um but it's way better value than all of the sort of mass-produced wine <laughs> that you find in your local corner shop and it probably lasts better being on the shelf there because it's fortified too yeah, right. so they've all been sitting around in the but, hot yeah yeah and um, yeah I mean you know also you can find some good old champagne like some Bollinger that's been on a shelf oh, for I love. it can be even better I used to live next to the train station in Brighton. Man, that corner shop was epic. <laughs> Everyone's going there for their last minute gifts, so it's like... Sometimes you get to late gifts. I like, know the one that you're thinking about as well. I kind of feel like England sometimes has like better corner shop action than... I mean, I don't the know only di- The only difference is, which is where Germany wins, there's furniture in corner shops here, so you can see yeah, how the drinks Fair are. enough. Yeah. They don't have sherry. Pre-corona, at least. Yeah, yeah. 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 pre-corona, yeah, you do love that. Yeah. That you have, like, you just chill at the corner It's the cheapest place to drink. I mean, if you want to watch, like... You can drink beers for a euro. Yeah, it's, like, the best place when it's, like, euro, like, the euro football. That's how much I watch football. And I'm like, you know, the that... Euro, euro cup. The euro cup, yeah. 
<laughs> but I love the European Cup and the World Cup and the World Cup. You know, just all the the only football I would watch. The, those, those those abstract human constructs. I know, but you know what's the cups, like, the football cups. The, I mean, they only happen every couple of years. It's not like part every of my two routine. years. No, it's still not part of my routine. I don't care enough. But what I do love is sitting at Spetti's here on furniture and drinking cheap alcohol that you don't have to sit in a sports bar and pay like a huge markup. You can sit on a bench outside and watch a telly that's been put on a milk crate and it has a much more oh, authentic yes, feeling. feeling about it. Mm-hmm. You have to pee. It's so trashy there. that it becomes less trashy. There's no loo, you might have to pee behind a van, but you might have to pee behind that very chair of Because it's the only place. But it's also fun. Part of the appeal. Oh. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we close? No, up I think we've yeah. got Jess, I think we'll finish on that <laughs> television <laughs> <especially. Yeah. laughs> So uh, if you have any questions, suggestions and whatever, love letters. You can send them <laughs> to us on Instagram at juice.podcast. And on Twitter at juice underscore, underscore podcast. And you can find us each individually <laughs> on Instagram, myself at Gwen Douglas with a U, G U E N, Gwen Douglas, and Emily Harm. Well, no, it's not actually Emily Harm. <laughs> that's her name, but that's you mine. Find... Yeah, I know, it's usually your name. I went uh, into autopilot. <laughs> you can find me at Vina Looper. Uh, on Instagram and Looper. on Twitter, yeah, at Fina Lupa. Yes. Otherwise, just Google us. It's not that hard. Yes. <laughs> uh, until next time. And subscribe. Yeah, subscribe. <laughs>